Thank you. Hello, I'm Gregory Payne, the Chair of Communication Studies, the first communication department in the United States. I would like to welcome all of you tonight for a very special Southwick recital. As many of you know, the Southwick is one of the oldest continuous recital series in the United States, another reason why we see it as a very important part of the legacy at Emerson. This is special because tonight we are here for the eighth annual Emerson Blancarna Summit between Emerson College as well as Blancarna School of Communication in Barcelona. This caps off two days of a pre-summit, which is also going to be followed by a salute to Emerson polling at the British Embassy tomorrow night, and then an all-day affair at the Watergate Hotel, culminating in, of course, legendary journalist Bob Woodward giving a speech. So what I would like to do is to welcome you to something that's a part of the Emerson tradition, and welcome also the MCs for tonight, Ken Grout, could we give him a hand? And Leo Wilson, who will be our Masters of Ceremony. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to see you all. Welcome to the Fall 2022 Southwick Recital. My name's Ken Grout, Leo. I'm Leo. This is Leo Wilson, and um, we're very pleased to be here tonight, but I, if I seem a little, it's because this is my first time with a co-host. That's correct. This is the fifth Southwick that I've done, and I've always, I've always done them alone. That's I mean, not alone, but you know. Also correct. Well, I just, here's the, the I'm just, I, how did you, you know, well, it was your idea. You asked me to be here. Banter. <laughs> All right. So we have tonight some, uh, some wonderful performers. And we've got spoken word. Uh, let's see. We've got six spoken word pieces. Two alums. Two professors. And two students. And then in addition to that, we've got one dance and one song. So. Without further ado, let's get things started and introduce our first presenter. The interim dean of the School of Communications here at Emerson. With his piece entitled, Hungry and Scared, Salat, Schussel und Pommes Frites. Please welcome Brent Smith. So how are we feeling about this right now? Feeling good? Well, in einem Moment, ich fühle Angst, Verzweiflung und Panik. Ich bin gerade aus dem Zug gestiegen. Tübingen, Deutschland. Kleine, schöne Stadt. Austauschstudent. Weiß ich nicht, was ich tun soll. So basically, I get off the train in Tübingen, Germany. It's a long time ago. And here I am, the first one in my family doing this again. Getting on a plane, traveling across an ocean, going to some country where I might not have any business being there, but I say, hey, let's give this a try. I walk from the train station, find my new apartment at 48 Konrad Adenauer Straße. I see a person who I think is kind of in charge, and I kind of say, ich suche den Bürgermeister. I'm looking for the mayor. That's what he did. <laughs> He's like, what? I said, Entschuldigung, sorry. Ich meine, ich suche den Hausmeister. I meant to say, I'm looking for the janitor. He's like, what? He's like, I'm the, ha I'm the landlord. And I said, yeah. You're who I'm looking for. That was the beginning of a day where I realized I had a chance to quit. And it would have been all right with my parents who were terrified that I chose to leave the country and go someplace no one had ever been, especially them. I make my way into my apartment, meet my sweet mates. Landlord says, hey, Daniel, 
this American guy speaks awful German. I think he's gonna go back home in about a week. Almost true. So day goes on, my stomach starts making all these weird noises. It's nerves, it's hunger, it's fear. And I realize, wow, I really need to eat because you know it's getting dark. So I make my way to Center City, Tübingen. And I hear all this chatter. I, I see friends and family having fun at the donut kebab stand. I'm passing these eateries to the left and the right. I'm like, wow, some of that food looks really good. I don't eat pork, but that other stuff, that looks pretty good. Thing is, I don't have the words, I don't have the vocabulary. And I'm a person who is always prepared, always confident, always rather familiar with where I've been to this point, and this was anything but. Wait a minute, I hear a car pass by and somehow it's, they reminisce over you by Pete Rock and CL Smooth. And I'm like, yeah. Thing is, it's in a car, radio. And just like that moment, I was home for a moment, but then it was a fleeting moment, and it was gone. And here I was again alone, trying to figure out, so what am I gonna eat? And somewhat miraculously, I turn the corner and I see the golden arches. Reminds me, takes me back to those road trips we would take to see our relatives in Philly. The Jersey Turnpike. McDonald's meant safety, refuge, clean restrooms and picture menus, it's like a point. So I walk in, I see this guy at the, uh, at the desk, he says, was möchten Sie? And I'm like, <laughs> ask me, okay, so what size fries would you like? And I'm like, <laughs> he gives up on me. I understand, because my German was awful. He didn't have the time, but uh, such as life is, this girl comes to, in, comes to his place and says, don't worry, I got you. And this is my saving grace. It's almost like I had one uh, who wants to be a millionaire. She threw me a lifeline. I make my order. I say, I'd like some pomme frites, because it's a French word, right? Pomme frites, I'd like no pommes frites. Like, okay, I'll remember that for next time. And then I get a burger, because it's McDonald's. And I see behind her a bowl with salad in it. And I'm like, I don't have any utensils in my apartment. I don't have anything to eat in or on. I need that bowl. Salat, uh-huh. So I get the fries, the burger, and the salad. Really, I'm getting the bowl, though. In this bowl, for me, it's almost like when I see someone who pushes a cart through the street kind of everywhere they go. In a way, they're kind of carrying or pushing everything they've got with them. So I eat my salad, really so I can empty it, so I have a clean bowl. I go on about my business, and don't you know, I wash this bowl every day for weeks, every day. I keep it clean, I kind of hold it like that egg in the high school project you take care of, that's strong but delicate, you don't want it to crack. That's this bowl for me. I have oatmeal packets, enough to get me through for a little while until my friend Yolanda Williams can go to the grocery store with me and basically grab me all the things I need because she's fluent in German. One day, the bowl cracks. And I'm like, oh man, what am I gonna do? I get a black and white TV. And miraculously, I discover David Heiselhoff is a pretty big thing. Dude from Knight Rider is apparently a rock star in Germany. And they've taken Baywatch episodes and maybe a little Martin Lawrence shows, and they've translated uh, these English shows into German. 
So I get my Langenscheid's dictionary and my notepad, and I write down every single sentence I hear, like every single sentence I hear. And I study the gestures and the expressions and all that stuff. I would later go on to get another bowl with salad in it. So glad I didn't quit. So glad I got to learn how important a stranger can be sometimes and they just kind of throw you a line and say, hey, I got you. It just reminded me like of that soundtrack from soul to soul, keep on moving, keep on moving. I would wear that song out. I also wore out that bowl, but it's kind of still with me in my hands right now. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. All right, the, um, the personal narratives that you're gonna hear this evening are personal narratives because these are stories that the presenters have chosen to share from their own lives. So we carve out our experiences and we share a little of that with you. I hope you recognize the power of that. And the, um, the Southwick, I just want you to know, is a tradition that's been going on at Emerson since 1900. So we are very, very, very pleased and privileged to take part in that and to continue it. And our next presenter is uh, going to share a piece out of her story. So please welcome, with her tale called Fish Out of Water and Into Concrete, Daniela Lopez White. Happy midterms. I don't have the capacity to memorize things. Oh my God. Is that Harvard? No way, wait, look. The buildings are so cool. This is literally where Legally Blonde was filmed. Can we please walk in the courtyard? I need to see it, it's freaking Harvard. Dude, can you shut up? You're acting like a tourist right now and it's kind of annoying. I was born on a rock known as Hawaii, or Hawaii, or I guess as everyone says it here, Hawaii. I was born and raised there, and for 18 years of my life, I had only ever left to go to Mexico to visit my mom's family. I lived on the island of Oahu, a chain of small towns. Technically, they're cities, but you'd look at them at towns. Not us, though. The only town we knew was downtown, Waikiki, Honolulu. Crowded beaches, overpriced shave ice, and tourists with skin as red as lobsters. Me and the other kids from my city of a beach didn't really go downtown much. See, Hawaii is small, but Eva Beach is smaller. You knew everyone in your neighborhood and the one next to it. You know everyone in your school, you know everyone at your church, you knew everyone at the grocery store, and if you didn't, see, in Hawaii, we actually talk to one another in the stores and on the streets, so you'd meet them eventually. For the first half of my life, Eva consisted of one church, one high school, one middle school, like three elementary schools, four fast food places, and two shopping plazas, each with a grocery store, a blockbuster, a small restaurant, and in one of them, a Jamba Juice. The old Eva Plaza had a pet depot, so all the beta fish and guinea pigs in town originated from there. You hung out at the playground until you turned old enough to go to the field park across the high school. You learned the bus routes, and unless you had the money to take the bus like 20 minutes down to the mall, that was life. But then, one of the most exciting things happened to Eva Beach. New houses sprung up, a new development, really. One for rich people, but with rich people came rich people shopping. The Laulani Village Shopping Center. It had a Safeway, a T-Mobile, a new pet store, a Supercuts, a nail salon, and wait for it a Ross dress for less. <laughs> this wasn't your Walmart shirts and slippers. They had Tommy Hilfiger dresses, Nike and Adidas for $20, 
Michael Kors, Calvin Klein. Plus, it had AC. When I was 13, the nicest purse I had was one I stole from my mom. It had become sticky from constant use, and by the time I graduated middle school, I knew it was time for a new one and was luckily in possession of some serious cash. At least what a 13-year-old would need would call serious cash. I walked into Ross with my friend, determined to spend, and I knew when I saw it, it was mine. A beige leather Kate Spade purse. It was elegant, it was fancy, it was mature, and it was $27. It was the purse I would use for almost every Sunday at church after that for every student council initiation, for every backyard party. And when I packed to leave for college in Boston, it was one of the things I made certain left the rock with me. For a kid who had never seen a real city before, I was a city lover from the first moment I stood in the Boston Commons. I definitely pulled a muscle in my neck from walking around with my head like this all the time, but it was worth it. The funny thing about coming from Hawaii is that you grow up in everyone's idea of paradise. But me? I had never forgotten about a blue ocean so quickly. A concrete sea. That's where I knew I was meant to swim and it felt like this is where my heart knew it belonged, even though I'd never been to Boston before. I mean, no one ever told me that rain could be ice cold. Drops hitting your face like little knives until you're numb. It felt like I was in the ice rink 24-7 and I was obsessed with it. Leaves, oh my god, leaves change colors. Not just green to yellow like back home. Green to yellow to orange to scarlet to apple red to crunchy brown to dusty gray to dead and gone. One day I could see all of the colors in the common and the next I could see through the trees to Beacon Hill. And snow. Have you ever seen a Hawaii kid in snowfall for the first time? I pulled on my gloves and my scarf and my puffer jacket and I left for class 20 minutes early. I didn't know snow was wet. In the movies, the only place I'd ever actually seen snow, it's either gentle white flakes or it's just gone. It's never wet. I nearly slipped into my building, teeth chattering in a wild grin. And I didn't even feel a hint of embarrassment when the security guard had to hand me a paper towel to wipe the mascara that was cascading down my frozen cheeks because snow was wet. I was born in America, but the East Coast and Hawaii are at two very different points on the globe. See, Eva Beach isn't notorious for sending kids off island. Most kids go to college in town, if they go, and then they live on the rock forever. Those who did leave almost always went to California, which is a big deal. Going anywhere on the mainland is a very big deal. Some kids even managed to go as far as Arizona. It had never occurred to me that there was an entire world beyond my little rock. And maybe that's why when I did find out, I was so determined to make my way there and never even think of looking back. For more than six months, I was in what culture shock experts call the honeymoon period with Boston. I spent my entire childhood snickering at poor sunburnt tourists on the island, but in Boston, I was the Howie, the gringa, the foreigner. I took pictures of old buildings to send to my mom. I definitely fed the squirrels on the common like too many pastries. I swore I figured out the tea, but I kept going inbound when I was supposed to go outbound. And I still remember the moment I finally understood daylight savings time. It was all new and exhilarating and exciting until my friend told me to shut up for getting excited over Harvard. All of a sudden, I realized that here, now, to them, I was that poor sunburnt tourist. They don't have a Ross in Boston, but they have Harvard right around the corner an Ivy League school, big name, brand name. 
I felt like I was 10, getting excited over a retail clothing store next to people who grew up shopping in New York City where the brands were created. I think that day was the first time I walked with my head down in Boston. I ignored how big the buildings were looming over me in all their glory. For the first time, I realized what it meant for everything to be so big because I felt so small. The honeymoon period was over. <laughs> People in Boston don't smile at you on the street. The pineapple they sell in the school store is super bitter. Yes, the snow is wet, but it is also cold and slippery and dangerous. No one knows how to make rice properly and it's not sushi rice, okay? It's just white fucking rice and it doesn't even really matter what you call it since nobody knows how to make it anyways. And when I turn my head to look for mountains, all I can see are looming gray building tops. Concrete, see my ass. This is more like a concrete tsunami. I have no life jacket here and I could drown. And maybe I should transfer to California. Maybe I stretched a little bit too far, wished a little too hard. Some of my friends <laughs> complain that Boston is too small, too sleepy, not enough somehow, not enough. How can it not be enough? I could drown. And then it was over. <laughs> Freshman year, just over. I mean, I made it. I packed it all up into the same suitcase I bought at Ross Dress for Less 10 months earlier. And the plane flew and flew and flew those 14 hours and finally pulled over the bright blue waters of Hawaii. And I got out and I looked and I could see my entire side of the island. I could see from from beach to beach to beach. Since when was my high school, my alma mater, the biggest public school in the state, so damn small? Had it changed? There was no concrete anywhere. Everything was so clear and open and breezy, and I couldn't breathe. And I remembered why I left in the first place. If I swim in the same water for the rest of my life, I will sink willingly. That is what drowning is. I entered my sophomore year of college that fall. Now that my head wasn't full of angel choirs every time that I saw a building, I got to look at the city with clear eyes and a straight neck. Some days, if I don't walk fast enough, I hear the sighs behind me almost as loud as the screeches of the tea beneath me. Some days, I slip three times on the ice before remembering that I now know that snow is wet, and wet freezes, and freezes, is slippery. Some days, I feel like I know nothing at all. Some days, I know I don't. But some days, I will walk with my friend from Illinois and we will marvel at how one street looks completely different from the next, and we discuss architecture. Some days I laugh with my friend from New Jersey about how Dunkin' Donuts makes the exact same order completely different every single time. But we order it again anyways. <laughs> Some days my friend from Maine will take me out in the snow and take pictures as I marvel and set it as my contact picture every new time. Some days I beg my friend from Manhattan to describe to me the Empire State Building in great detail, and they laugh at me, but they also promise me I'll see it one day, and I believe them. Some days I still feel small in a place like this, but I now face winter with no mascara, proper snow boots, and an ongoing respect for the ice, if not a little fear. <laughs> I keep with me my beige Kate Spade bag from Ross Dress for Less. It's big enough to hold it all, new and old. But I like that it's small enough to find what I need. I'm still figuring out exactly what that is most of the time, but I like the way being small gives you more room to grow and to change and to learn. I'm still a girl from Hawaii, <laughs> Hawaii but now I'm learning what that means to me and to you. 
And some days, all I can do is learn. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. So we're back. So we're back. How's co-hosting working out for you so far? Well, it's my second time on stage, so pretty well. Yeah, I think, I think you're doing quite well, in fact. And we're, this is banter. And here's, here's what you don't see on television shows. When this, are we good? No, no. When this, see, when this kind of thing happens and the hosts just sort of do their thing, and then there's all this production stuff that happens, we're bringing out a second mic. Why are we bringing a second mic? Well, because our next performer uh, is here to teach us that personal narratives don't just have to be spoken word, they can also be told through music. Hmm. A song, perhaps? A song, perhaps. All right. And <laughs> is this a song that... In fact, his song is called, I'll Make It Mine. Please welcome Nejem Rahim. Co-hosts. Hi. Are you ready? If you haven't performed at the South Brooklyn, um, I would strongly recommend it. It's a pretty unusual experience, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but we don't do a ton of stuff. I was just thinking about this. This is my only, only my second time doing this, but we don't do a ton of stuff here where. Maybe we do, I don't know, I'm just missing it. Um, faculty and students are both kind of equally exposed. Is that right? What do you think? I agree. Yeah? It's kind of cool. Um, that's kind of cool. And listening to Daniela's presentation about growing up in Hawaii and coming to Boston, that's funny, I've been living, I, mean, I was born in the States <laughs> like you were. Uh, but I lived overseas for a long time in warm countries. And uh, when I moved back to the U.S., I was having some of the same experiences. Um, yeah, it was just interesting. That's super cool. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of people out there. That's super cool. Um, hey, who's that? This is Warwick. Oh, hey. Hi, oh, no way. Sorry. Hey, man. <laughs> I, can, I, I can't really see. You know, the house lights are wicked bright. Um, Morgan is a killer guitar player. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna play a song. Uh, I wrote this song. <laughs> it's a personal narrative. <laughs> it's called I'll Make It Mine. Does this sound okay out there? Can you hear me? <laughs> You're awesome, thank you. We 
had met that last winter back at Robbie Garcia's. I put on handful of beauty. She scornfully turned that shit off. It seemed to confirm my jackass idea that beautiful women are spoiled. Have no manners at all. So many things, man, I should have been bolder. I didn't see her again till fall turned to spring. All right, I admit. I have thought of it so many times. Lighting up the trees through the centuries with no reason no harm. I was walking to Jennings, it was probably October. Trees dropping their leaves on the ground, starting to smell of decay. She's standing there smoking, not talking to nobody, glowing like only a girl can, who's out of my Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Ken? Ken Leo? Leo. Where's Leo? The co host thing didn't work. <laughs> oh. Uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> he doesn't know yet. But I'll be on my way. <laughs> no, you're fine. All right, so our. Thank you. Good. And um, to Nedjum's point about this being an opportunity for faculty and students to work together, and I would be remiss if I did not also, again, thank Dr. Payne for opening up for us and the dean uh, for taking part as well, because this is an event that we should all be celebrating. So I thank them for their support on that as well. More, however, than anyone else, I would be extra remiss if I didn't thank all of you because it's easier to be somewhere else, probably. 
So you've chosen to come uh, for whatever reason, or whatever 10 reasons, see what I did? And, um, but I thank you for that. I thank you for that sincerely on behalf of all of us. Thank you for attending. All right. Next up, please welcome performing his piece entitled The F Word. This is Jay Nagy. Do you see that? Let me show you. Right over here is our bar, all right? It's got this brown maple wood top. It's so slippery and shiny, you could slide all over it. And on top of them are these assorted bowls of different sizes with chopped onion and garlic and broccoli and chicken cut in precisely into one inch pieces. Right over here, is me, around eight years old. And where I'm standing is my dad. My dad loves to cook. I grew up watching him cook for parties and guests, and food was huge in our family. In fact, I think the number one question throughout my entire life has been, What's there for dinner? I love food so much that I remember going to school just waiting for the clock to strike one so that it could hit lunchtime and I could find out what I have packed for me. Sometimes I would die so much out of curiosity and I would sneak up to my bag during the class, zip it up open, take a peek into my lunchbox and then I'll be a little satisfied. Uh, but my dad really loved to cook. In fact, he was so passionate about cooking for people that he rejected a bunch of different houses when we were supposed to move in when I was 12, just because it didn't have ample space in the living room for his cooking station. And he was serious about it because when we actually moved to a place, he got this whole thing built. He had this granite slab cut into three different slots so that he could put his stove, his grill, and teppanyaki, those iron griddles you see in Benihana, right? And then underneath the table was this drawer filled with these very identical white boxes so he could put all of his assorted fruits and vegetables cut into pieces. And on the side was this other drawer for his spices and oils and all sorts of stuff. He hunted down every single cooking store in the city until finally one day he came across this book. It was called the Chocolate Bible. He liked it, so he bought it and presented it to me. He had marked three recipes on it, and he said, pick one. So I looked through it, tiramisu, chocolate cake, and chocolate mousse. I picked chocolate mousse, fancy. Huh? He was like, all right. He says, let's go. He takes me in his car, and he takes me all the way to the speciality grocery store, the one that he only goes to when he's cooking for his guests. And when we reached there, he took me through every aisle to find the ingredients, eggs, unsalted butter, sugar. And when we finally came to chocolate, he didn't take me to the chocolate aisle. No, he took me to the bakery aisle, and he asked the guy for an unbranded slab of dark chocolate. So the guy got out this brick and a saw and cut out this piece of dark chocolate and gave it to us almost like it was cocaine. <laughs> so he took it, he came home, and he left me alone, and I got to work. I opened up that book, and I read the recipe word by word. And I made the chocolate mousse, and by the time I was done, my dad came, he gave me these two cups, 
I ladled the chocolate mousse into those cups. I placed them in the fridge. And by the time dinner was done, he gave the signal. So I brought out those two cups, gave one to dad, and just before I was giving it to mom, he said, stop. That one's for you. And then I realized my dad doesn't serve anything to my mom until it was perfect. So I sat back down and I look at him. He carves up a bite, puts in his mouth, and goes, mmm. A human moan is an effortless vibrational sound of a prolonged exhalation that releases pain, stress, and other toxins in your body. And that's what my moose did to him. <laughs> so I look back at him. He takes another bite. And he goes, mmm. And then... He looks at my mom and passes her the cup. <sighs> Finally, he looked at me and he said, hundred times. I'm sorry, what? Hundred times. Hundred, you want me to make this mousse a hundred times? There's so many other recipes. Why can't I just make them? We can cook something else. Hundred times. This one. I didn't touch that book for a week. I was furious, furious, hundred times. That's insane. So I cooled down. Came back to that book a week later. And I was like, okay, I'll try it again. I got out all the ingredients and I read the recipe word by word. I melted the chocolate with the butter. I took out the eggs. I split them. I took the egg yolk. I mixed it with the cream. I took the egg white. I split it. And then after that, I whipped it with some sugar. But I can't use regular sugar. I have to use caster sugar because it dissolves better. But if that's, you don't have that, it's fine. You can take the sugar and put it in a blender, and it'll be OK. Then when you're ready, you mix everything together. And then after that, you place it in a bowl. You put it in the fridge. And then you cool it. You eat it. And then you do it again. Ah, oh, 99 times. Seventeen times into it, my dad got me a blender. <laughs> Those whisking things you see in cooking shows. Forty times into it, he went on a business trip and got me dark chocolate from Ghana. <laughs> and then soon enough, I was making dessert for his guests. He would cook, and I would make the mousse. He would make stir fry, I would make the mousse. He would make grilled chicken, and I would make the mousse. <laughs> and finally, one day, he was cooking for guests, and he looked at me, and he said, do you want to take over? So I walked up to the counter, and I smelt what he was making. And I could tell exactly what it smelled like and taste it just from the scent and the aromas. But it was missing something. It was too spicy. It needed a pop. So I asked him, Dad, can I, 
Can I add something to it? So I did. Put some sugar to balance out the spice. I put a little bit of lime to add a tangy touch. I mix it together and I gave it to him. He takes a bite and he goes, mmm. And then I became the chef. I would make the meals and I would make the dessert. I would make the stir fry and I would make the dessert. And then I would make the grilled chicken and I would make the dessert. I've been cooking for 11 years now. And I cook with my heart. I don't use many measurements. I don't use a tablespoon or anything like that. But if I'm making mousse, the chocolate Bible is open in my counter. There's 200 pages in that book, but 199 of those untouched. That one page has stains of melted chocolate and granules of sugar stuck to it. Every single time I cook for someone, my heart just waits for that. Mm. Our next presenter is an alum coming all the way from Pennsylvania with her piece entitled 28 Years. Please welcome Heidi Rose. Amy, more than my cousin, we were actually biological half-sisters because our mothers are identical twins. And we were exactly the same age, born five months apart. On New Year's Eve, 28 years ago, in New Orleans, someone took a gun aimed it high up into the sky, pulled the trigger, and when that bullet came down, it hit and killed Amy, and only Amy, in a crowd of hundreds of people. But years before that, Amy became an Emersonian, doing theater, writing poetry. And then a few years later, I too became an Emersonian for graduate school, choosing Emerson in part because it let me live close to Amy. Emerson was one of Amy's beginnings, one place of her beginning. New Orleans was the place of her ending. It's curious and at times still unfathomable to me that I've now lived nearly as long without her as with her. I'm gonna share a poem that she wrote when we were 17 after a good friend of hers died unexpectedly. Not as random a death as hers, but sudden and without warning. I've added a little bit of my story to her words. You'll be there at my wedding. I know you will. At the birth of my children, you'll enter from the back of the church and you'll say, fooled ya, whenever I need to laugh. You have to be there. Everyone else will be, 
They're all coming in for the occasion. Everyone who was anyone to you, why shouldn't you be there too? When it happened, Cousin Tina said, Amy came to me in a dream last night and she told me to tell you that she's okay. Fuck you, Cousin Tina, is what I want to say. I don't want to say she means well. Instead, if we're so close, then why didn't she come to me? Cousin Tina has an answer for that. You're in too much pain. She couldn't get through. Mm. Right. It's six hours away. And as it draws closer, I'm smiling, unknowing satisfaction that you'll be there. A year after you were killed, I waited in Jackson Square, waiting for your sculpture to be dedicated, trying to feel you. And I am still looking, still trying. After 28 years, there are too many people who aren't you. I've read two obituaries, two scandalous newspaper articles. I've seen countless faces of family and friends brought dinner to your family. There are too many people who aren't you. What will it take for me to know? Everyone has an answer except me. What will it take for me to stop expecting you every moment of the day you weren't at my wedding? To stop running to the mailbox? My children don't know you. To stop expecting you to answer your own door? I can't laugh the same way. To stop running to every piano I hear being played, expecting it to be you? If you appeared now, would you know me? I will never fully recognize myself without you. Someone had a gun, pulled that trigger during a celebration. In an instant, you're gone. Thank you so much, Heidi. One of the great things about personal narrative is um, people can share their stories. And we share our stories primarily utilizing language, as, as you've seen. But as Nedjum shared with us, you can also share a personal narrative through song. And come to find out, you can share a personal narrative through dance. So what we're going to see right now is a dance that was inspired by a personal narrative. And because I teach, so I can't leave you out of it. After you see the dance, I'm going to ask you to give some uh, shout outs as to what you think the dance is conveying. Any images that come to mind, any, any phrases, any, any language you can use to, to share with us. So watch the dance, and then we'll talk afterwards. This is without words. Please welcome the dancer and choreographer, Caroline Laringiera. Thank you, Caroline. I could not do that for love or money. Thank you for that. Thoughts? 
What's that dance say to you? Just words, phrases, anything that comes to mind. Upbeat. Celebration. Beautiful. Celebration. Freedom. Freedom. Voice. Voice. Beautiful. Beautiful. That's it. Progression. Now I'm scared. What? Finding your rhythm. Awesome. Funky love. That's good. Thank you for that. Here's the thing. All of those, uh, all of those interpretations are individual. That's the great thing about watching something like this. Words tend to express more clearly, but sometimes they can find. The dance uh, takes us somewhere else. So now I want you to hear the piece that was written that inspired that dance. So watch the dance again and listen to the piece as our own Leo Wilson recites without words, except this time with words. For as long as I can remember, I've been able to operate in crisis. This doesn't mean that I'm calm under pressure. In fact, it's usually the opposite. I'm stressed, frantic, manic, the human embodiment of a stress ball that has been placed in a vice grip. However, despite my frenzied state, I always find a way to manage the disaster, and I'm ready to do it all again the next day. My therapist has heard me refer to myself as a hurricane dog. I'm comfortable in a crisis, but when the crisis passes, I'm left with a sense of unceasing discomfort and anxiety. It's true that I'm always on the lookout for the next disaster, but I rest easy knowing that I've weathered countless storms before this one. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Leo. That was kind of cool. All right. <laughs> uh, next up, we heard from Heidi Rose, an alum who came from Pennsylvania. Now we're going to hear from our second alum on this evening's program. She's made the uh, voyage here from the great state of Connecticut. So with a piece of her own construction entitled Finding My Voice, please won't you put your hands together for Emma Palzier Ray. I was always a good girl. I never got in trouble. I got straight A's. I took ballet lessons. And my room was pink. As I grew older, I started to find myself. And I realized that although I was a good girl, I wasn't like the other kids. I saw the world differently. I was an artist an actress. Spring 1980, senior year talent show. My friend Joanne choreographed a jazz ballet to Shadow Dancing by Andy Gibb. She wore white and I wore black. And I wrote a skit for Joanne and me and two other friends, Gina and Andrea, to perform. We were the Rogers family. You know, like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? My idea was to show what Mr. Rogers was like at home. What if he was exactly the same after he left WQED? So this is how it went. Mr. Rogers comes home. He's carrying a brown paper sack. He's greeted by Mrs. Rogers, a son, and a daughter. They all change their cardigans together, and then they sit on the couch, and they all change their sneakers in unison. Then Mr. Rogers takes out the paper sack and announces, tonight is craft night for the Rogers family. We're going to learn how to take everyday household objects and turn them into something new just by using your imagination. He reaches into the brown paper sack, and he pulls out a bra, a 40 triple D bra that we borrowed from Gina's mom. And then he pulls out a jock strap. I think that came from Gina's house, too. 
And he goes on to explain that these items can become a plant hanger, earmuffs, a nose warmer. Funny, right? Well, the day after rehearsal, for the first time in my life, I am called down to the principal's office. Mr. Perlini told me that I can't perform the skit if a jock strap is used as a prop. I feel heat rise up from the soles of my feet. No mention of the bra, a comically large bra at that, just no jock strap. Why am I stuck in this stupid school in this stupid town? See, summer before junior year, I painted my room. I didn't want pink anymore, but I couldn't decide on a color, so I painted a mural of a rainbow. I discovered the Ramones and the Sex Pistols. I colored my sneakers red and purple with markers because I didn't want black or white. I was growing up in a town where everyone strived to be mediocre where fitting in means more than anything. Well, I don't want black and white, I don't want to be mediocre, and I don't fit in. And if I see that jock strap on that stage, you will not graduate high school, young lady. I am a good girl, so I just leave the office. I guess Mr. Perlini called my parents because when I get home, they're waiting for me. They understand when I say, I don't understand why we can use one prop and not the other. What is he so afraid of? I wish he would just tell us we can't do the skit at all instead of ruining it. I don't get it, but I know it's wrong. My parents are as mad as I am, but they also understand that I won't graduate high school if I stand my ground. And so they say, we agree with you 100%, Emma. Mr. Perlini is wrong to ask you to remove one prop and not the other one. But uh, there are times in life when you have to choose what's most important. You can fight this battle another time. Right now, you have to graduate high school. You don't have a choice about that. Even though my skit was altered for the sake of graduating, it was a hit. People laughed a lot. <laughs> so there you have it. I lost my voice, I got my diploma, and a seed was planted. But I didn't see myself as a feminist or an activist of any kind, not for years. But now I realize that this experience my senior year nurtured those qualities in me and I was forever changed. Who would have guessed that that jockstrap would have been the catalyst for creating this feminist? I left my hometown for Emerson College, moved to New York and never looked back. Today, I always speak up, and I have never let anyone censor me again. Um, by the way, before Mr. Perlini retired, he took down the display case with all the football trophies, and in its place, he hung a large, very red and purple, Jackson Pollock-inspired painting created in 1980 by this very good girl. Our final performer tonight, yes, I know, I'm sad too, is someone who I have waited to see on this stage. Um, someone who is making their Southwick debut, never before seen, with his piece entitled Sweet and Sour Sweater. Please welcome Ken Grout.
Her name was Erica. She was the 12-year-old second chair flute player in the Lars Holmgren Middle School Band, West Des Moines, Iowa. I was there doing my student teaching to complete my bachelor's degree in music education, Drake University. Very good school, a little pricey. They had a music business program, Drake. See, that's why I went there in the first place. I, I wanted to be a writer for Billboard magazine. You know, Billboard, the pinnacle of the music industry. Charts analysis, album reviews. I never told anyone that's what I wanted to do. Because quite frankly, it seemed like the kind of thing other people were going to say was ridiculous, you know? That it wasn't real, it wasn't a thing. So I didn't, I didn't say it out loud. But it was the dream. And I thought, music business, right for Billboard. I'll make it work. <laughs> Junior year, I could see commencement on the horizon. So I decided to add in music education because I knew even then that getting a job as a teacher would be a whole hell of a lot easier than getting a job as a dreamer. I guess I was always more of a what do they have? I'll make it work. As opposed to, what do I want? I'll go find it, kind of a guy. <laughs> oh. She was tall for her age, Ella. She was uh, angular and spindly with, with uh, dirty blonde undercurl flouncy bob, and she wore these enormous plastic framed eyeglasses. And she had this way of asking a question. She would snake her hand up the right side of her body and hold it torso high, hovering until the moment struck. Ah, uh, Mr. Grout? Yes, Erica, what is it? Could I have the hall pass, please? Well, yes, it's right here, come get it. I need to use the restroom. Well, then you'll need the hall pass, so come get it. My mother says if you've got to go, you've got to go. There's no sense holding it, not in this country, not in 1982. <laughs> Couple things you might have noticed about Erica. She held her hand up throughout the conversation. She over-explained and over-defended. Oh, yes. And she invoked the wisdom of her mother at every possible turn. And Erica didn't limit her contribution to mere questions. No, no, no. Erica observed. Ah, Mr. Grout? Yes, Erica, what is it? Last week, you told the French horns to play louder at letter G. Today, they didn't play louder at letter G. And you didn't stop and correct them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Erica, for your contribution. I appreciate it. My mother says, when you see something, say something. I saw something, so I said something. <laughs> Once again, Erica, your mother is becoming the single most valued member of this entire music program. <laughs> You're welcome. By the time the week was finished, so was I. Five days in a row of third period Erica was all this 21-year-old could stand. So, and it was dawning on me, you know? With a bachelor's degree in music education, this would be my day-to-day -day life. I mean, different kids, sure, but an Erica by any other name. So Friday night, I'd go back to my little studio apartment and prepare for the weekend. <laughs> Even though it was two and a half days away, I wanted to get started. Oh my God, I wish somebody would invent a phone where you could tell who's calling without having to answer it. <laughs> oh my God, what a great idea. I should write it down before I forget. 
Hello? Hey, Danny. Awful. How was yours? <laughs> I know, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, I should tell you since you're my best friend. I'm quitting college. <laughs> I'm tired of the university tedium, Daniel. Because I'm a fucking fraud, man. I mean, what the hell am I doing here? I don't even feel like part of my own life sometimes, you know? <laughs> Why am I working so hard for something I don't even want? <sighs> I know, I know. One more semester and then I'm certified. <laughs> I know. A certified middle school band director <laughs> in Iowa. <laughs> huh? Yeah, at Salvation Army store? Sure. What time tomorrow? All right, cool. We can go to McDonald's after. They've got those new chicken things. <laughs> yeah, McNuggets. Dig it. I know, nuggets, right? It's like gold. <laughs> There's gold in them. All right, bye. My friend picked me up the next day and we went to the Salvation Army. Nowadays it's called thrifting, but it didn't merit its own gerund then. It was just that I couldn't afford retail. So we got there and looked through the shirts and the pants and the jackets and the coats and the sweat. Dan. Danny. Daniel! Look. Men's XL. My God, what shade of green is this? I love this. They never get stuff like this in here. <gasps> Look at the tag. 100% virgin Scottish wool. It's European. Oh, Dan. I can't even pronounce it. Look, Lach, Lober, Aberdeen. Oh, it's Aberdeen. Well, still, Dan. Oh, my God. Look, get out, get out of the way. Get out of the way so I can see the mirror. Look. Look how it lays against me. Holy shit. Maybe I, maybe I can be a band director. <laughs> I mean, I look more adult, you know, right? I look more responsible. Jesus, I almost look like somebody who could afford to buy this sweater retail. Maybe I'm not a fraud. Monday morning came and I looked just as good as I knew I would. I was wearing my new Scottish green wool sweater with my white wide collared shirt with the brown stripes, beige thin whale Levi cords, and my earth shoes. I walked into Lars Holmgren with such a spring in my step that by the time third period came around, I decided to let the kids play the only thing they ever really wanted to rehearse anyway, the score to the movie Grease. Doom, do doom, do doom, do 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 doom, do doom. Okay, kids, that is coming along great. Now, clarinets, here's what I'm thinking. If you could just, ah, uh, Mr. Grout? Yes, Erica, what is it? Where'd you get that sweater? Oh. Um, I don't remember exactly. Why, do you like it? Mm hmm, my father used to have one just like it. Oh, well, I'm sure there's more than one sweater in the world like this, but you got a good eye. I like it a lot, too. Thanks for noticing. All right, now, clarinets, here's what I'm thinking. On that triplet, if you, ah, uh, Mr. Grout? <laughs> yes, Erica, what is it? I'm trying to have a conversation with the clarinets. Did you get that sweater at the poor people's store? What? <laughs> At the poor people store. You know, the one where the poor people shop. Um, I, see, we donated my father's sweater there after it was no good anymore. 
Well, I, it's okay if you did. My mother says poor people deserve nice things too, within reason. Well, uh, like I said, Erica, could you unroll the cuff, please? What? The cuff. See, my father was uh, smoking a cigarette when he was wearing that sweater, and he dropped the cigarette on the sleeve, so it made this icky burn mark that he could never get rid of, so he just started rolling up the cuff to cover it up. <laughs> well, that's very... Here, here, I'll show you. Sit down! The bell, the bell is going to ring sometime. So take your instruments apart and put them uh, just quietly and everyone, and then when the bell rings, you just get, go somewhere else. <laughs> the bell did ring and the kids did leave. And what happened next? I can only attribute to the marijuana. <laughs> See, because I knew, but I knew, that Erica was lurking outside the band room door, waiting in the hallway to peep up through the window to see me unroll the cuff to determine once and for all whether in fact I was wearing her father's cast off sweater and whether I was in fact a poor person. So I did the only thing I could do. I stood flush against the wall, directly next to the big band room door containing the big band room window, and the moment that I heard the slightest rustle in the hall, I struck. <laughs> it is not lost on me that I was mere months away from being given a piece of paper that said it would be appropriate for me to educate the youth of the state of Iowa. <laughs> and here I was trying feverishly to permanently traumatize one of them. <laughs> as ridiculous as it sounds, I mean, I must have looked like a madman. And it was crazy because Erica wasn't even outside the door anyway. <laughs> Who was outside the door, however, was Mr. Delacroix, the actual band director for the school. He was facing the window, having a conversation with a woman who was facing him. So when I did this, he did this, and she did this. And I retreated into the band room where five seconds later I heard this, Ken. Are you all right? <laughs> yes, Mr. Delacroix, hi, we had a really good rehearsal today. <laughs> all right, would you please come out and meet someone? This is Mrs. Muriel, uh, Mrs. Muriel Reynolds. She's on the Board of Education for the entire district, and she's the chairman, chairwoman, chairwoman of the Arts Committee that oversees all of this department's funding. This is Ken Grout, our student intern from Drake University. She shook my hand and rubbed my arm through the sweater. How do you do, young man? Fine, thank you. How are you finding things here? Very nice, thank you. She stopped shaking, but kept rubbing. <laughs> Delacroix says you're doing a great job. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you both. And Erica says you're tip top. Er Erica Reynolds. <laughs> Erica Reynolds is your daughter. <laughs> Delacroix, we've got a meeting, cafeteria. And as I watched Erica's mom lead Mr. Delacroix down the hall, to the Lars Holmgren Middle School cafeteria, I looked for a pen to scribble a note. Mr. D, not feeling like myself, 
going home for the day. I went out to the car. I, got, I went out to the parking lot and I got in the car that a friend of mine had loaned me for the semester. And when I was absolutely certain that no one was nearby, I unrolled the cuff. My thumb ran over the yellow and black raised tar stain. Did Muriel know? Did she know I was wearing her husband's hand-me-down? Shit. I took it off and I flung it on the floor of the passenger side. And even though I couldn't afford it, I drove to McDonald's, I got a six-piece chicken McNuggets with sweet and sour sauce, and I sat in the parking lot dipping and chomping and dipping and chomping. And when I was done, I took the greasy, sticky garbage, I wrapped it in that sweater, and I stuffed the whole woolly bundle in the West Des Moines McDonald's restaurant parking lot garbage bin. Then I gassed it the hell out of there. Because you know what? I'll be an adult tomorrow, OK? I'll be responsible. I'll have a nice sweater tomorrow. Maybe I'll be a band director. <laughs> I'll make it work. Or, <laughs> wait a minute, I can use a bachelor's degree to get a master's degree. I'll apply to grad school. I can study writing there. I can become a real writer. Emerson College in Boston. It's a very good school, a little pricey. <laughs> Jesus, maybe I'm more of a what I want, I'm going to go get kind of guy than I give myself credit for. Huh. <laughs> I'll be damned. Thank you all very much for coming to our friends from Spain. Bienvenido. Thank you so much for coming. We appreciate it. All of you, thank you again. We had a great time, and what a wonderful group of people, as are you. Thank you again. Go home. <laughs>